to the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles is where we'll be tonight. 2 Chronicles, and we're going to start in chapter 7. We'll move around a little bit. I like to look at the context of what is going on. I think that gives us a better viewpoint of Scripture. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I don't know what you think of when you think of revival. I'm afraid that in many churches that are around the country that revival is an event on the calendar and nothing more. Yes. And, and that it is something that we do just because that's what's there. And there's little expectation other than we go, we listen to preaching, and we go home. And maybe we hope for God to do a little work in our lives, you know, maybe tweak the dial a little bit spiritually. But there's so much more that could be done. And, and I think that some of it is because we, we are outside sometimes of the context of what God has done through preaching. We have preaching because the Word of God ought to be preeminent in our churches. And this is what God uses to change our lives. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so the Word of God changes our lives, shows us where we're in error, but often it is it is our own hearts that need to be affected. And, and as I have read of revival, I was just doing some reading tonight just because I wanted to brush up on some of that. And it, it just in the little bit of reading that I did, I, it has compelled me to, to do a little bit more research uh, on revivals. I don't know what you've heard or different stories that you've heard of different revivals. One of the most famous one was the Welsh revival in, in the early 1900s and reading about some of those things that God did and that people at their workplaces, men at their workplaces in the coal mines would break out in, in singing, singing hymns, people on the streetcars. We don't have streetcars, but can you imagine a bus full of people and, and uh, just those people would break out in singing, that people would would kneel in prayer at random places in town with no one else around, just spontaneously kneel and repent of their sins in, in, in broad daylight, that people would would show up at churches for meetings, that the services would last two to three hours. Sometimes it was just prayer, testimony, and singing, and that, and that uh, repentance would take place, that the bars would close because no one was there. They'd all gone to the church to hear preaching. People would be peeking in through the windows because there was no standing room in the churches. They were so full of people. People beating on the doors trying to get in because they, they needed to hear that. The amount of conviction to where people would say, please, God, no more. I can't handle anymore. Can you imagine? Now, who has changed? Us or God? Yes. Right, right, right. It's, 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 uh, God's always going to be the same. Amen. And so it's our hearts. Now, at the same time, it disgusts me when revival is imitated. And, and there have been times in our country where either people or the devil has tried to infiltrate a church and and, and have a fake revival. It, it's imitated. And uh, Brownsburg, Florida was one of those churches, and there were, they called it a laughing revival. And, and sometimes people will try to do that in different churches today and, and manufacture the Spirit's work and, by doing crazy things. You know, this, this, uh, this whole Benny Hinn thing. I think we drove by a church recently, and there was a sign, and Benny Hinn was going to be there, and there was going to be a healing service. And I heard somebody recently say, if you could really do that, then why aren't you in Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis, right? If you could really heal people. But no, you got to make a show of it and take your coat off and slap people in the body with your coat and in their head with your, with your hand and do all kinds of crazy things like that that, that are just hype and there for money and, and prestige or whatever. But I hate it when people imitate revival. And sometimes people think that they can manufacture revival. We have to be careful of that. That if, that if we think that, that if we cause people to do certain things, and if we structure our service a certain way, and if we say certain things and, and, and maybe embarrass ourselves by, by confession, look, confession is important, but it ought to be something that God moves in your heart to do and not something that you do just so that you can maybe cause an emotional response. Because uh, there may be some emotion connected with revivals, but it's spiritual more than it is emotional. And often when we're convicted, there will be an emotional response. Pastor even talked about that. Maybe not. But the truth is God needs to do a work in our heart. Now that's what revival is. It's God doing a work in our heart. It's not these other things that maybe are effects, results of revival, but we don't do those things in order to get there. What we do is we go to the Word of God and, and we go to God in prayer and say, God, would you do something? Would you work in our hearts? 
And I do realize, I, there was a time that I thought, if, if a revival meeting happens, if an evangelist comes into a church, if I come into a church, and there is not this outpouring of people getting saved and people getting right with God, then, then someone failed. And, and, uh, and it's not God's fault. It's not the preacher's fault. And, and it really it may not be your fault. Because uh, God has to be the one that chooses to pour himself out on people. And sometimes we have to beg God to do that. And that doesn't mean that if we're begging God and he doesn't do it, that it's our fault or that it's God's fault. Sometimes it's God's timing. And, uh, and we, need to, we need to pray for that. We need to ask God to, to work in our hearts. Sometimes God is encouraging people through a revival. Sometimes he's nudging them in a certain direction. Sometimes he's correcting and, and keeping people inside the fences, if you will. There's many things that God could be doing in a church uh, because of whatever issues have gone on in the church and whatever things are going on in the country. At the same time, we can ask God to do great things, and I believe we should ask God to do great things. Are we not in great need? Yes. Is not God the God that can do this? Amen. Has he not given us something? Now, I want us to notice in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we, as, we, as we look at this, uh, much of 2 Chronicles is about Solomon building the temple and the dedication of it. Now, we are right in the middle of this dedication time. There has been the building, and when they built, uh, they would uh, often cut the wood. They wouldn't cut the wood at the property. They would cut it somewhere else. Can you imagine that, if you've ever built anything? Cutting all the wood somewhere else to size to bring it in and then assemble it so that the noise of the cutting, would, and they didn't have power tools, you know, just a hand sawing would not take place there so that that work would not take place there. Obviously, it had to be assembled. That Any stone that had to be cut, and some of that had to be perfect and exact, would be done somewhere else, and then the stones would be brought in as they were prepared and assembled. It was revered that much. And so here you have that, but, but then at the end of his prayer, this is what happens, chapter 7, verse number 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Now that is literal, and, and we're not asking fire to come down and consume anything or anyone, but what we want is to see God work in this way, isn't it? Yeah that the glory of God would be reflected in our lives and we would be changed. Verse two, and the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house. And they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord saying, for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. So seeing God and seeing God's glory and seeing God's work caused a physical response so that they were on their faces before God. I believe that God can still do that. Amen. I believe that this is not just an Old Testament thing, not to say, oh, we all need to get on our faces and, and make God do something, or, or, or that we should manufacture it in that way. No, but we could pray that God would, would move us to this situation so that our hearts were so affected by God that we couldn't help it. And then verse four, the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And the king offered a sacrifice of 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep so that the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. That's a lot. That's a lot. My, I think the point here is when God moved, it caused the people to respond to God in ways of praise, in worship, and giving, and sacrifice, and continue on. And the priests waited, verse 6, on their offices, the Levites also with instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord because his mercy endureth forever. When David praised by their ministry and the priests sounded the trumpets before them and all Israel stood. Moreover, Solomon hallowed the middle court that was before the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings because the brazen altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings and the meat offerings and the fat. Also at the same time, Solomon kept a feast seven days and all Israel with him, a very great congregation from the entering in of Hamath to the river of Egypt. So in other words, there were so many people that you had to describe the amount of people by distance, not by number. Can you imagine that we would say that, that all the people of Illinois came to worship God in Tower Hill and it was so big that it, that it moved from Tower Hill that the amount of people 
span from Tower Hill all the way to Shelbyville or something like that, you know, saying measurements to describe the amount of people, right? That, that's just amazing. You can see how they celebrated because of what God was doing. This wasn't just solemn, but it was exciting. Verse 10, and on the three and 20th day of the seventh month, he sent the people away into their heart, into their tents, glad and merry in their heart for the goodness of the Lord that had showed unto David and to Solomon and Israel, his people. So, so we can see this is, I can say that this is a revival. They were revived in their hearts for God. God had done a special work among them. He had honored them by choosing that place and that temple to dwell in. And, and Solomon had prayed, the, the heaven of heavens cannot contain God, yet why would he choose to, to dwell on earth with men? Why would he choose this place? This is only made by our hands. It is so limited, it is so finite, and yet an infinite God would choose this place. You realize that this is the temple that God dwells in, and, and we take it for granted. We, we think of it as mundane. We forget about that. We drag the Holy Spirit into our sins because he is with us at all times, and yet God has chosen us a, a redeemed people because this, this, this whole flesh is what he has chosen to, to dwell in. We ought to pray that God would do a special work in our lives. And, and I don't mean that to, to be, to speak in hyperbole, but honestly, every single one of us should be praying. I think first of all, because God has given us prayer. Well, let's think about prayer for a moment. Did God tell Adam to pray? No, but Adam prayed. Adam talked with the Lord. Did God tell, to, tell Noah to pray? No, but he talked with God. Enoch walked with God for 300 years. We never see that God told him to do that. He just did that. Abraham spoke with God, was, was a friend of God. Moses spake with God face to face as a man speaking unto his friend. David communicated with God. Solomon, a whole chapter of communicating with God. God has given us prayer. And I, I think about the Old Testament, and I can't find any commands to pray in the Old Testament. Seek the Lord, yes, but we come to the New Testament. Well, there's Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty thanks. But that's later on in Israel's history. The further you get from God's creation, the less man is seeking him. The further you get from, from the creation of, of man, the more God commands us to pray. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. That's what we're told. Colossians chapter four and verse two, uh, continue in prayer. Uh, Luke 18, Luke, Luke 21, 56, watch ye therefore and pray. Pray without ceasing, First Thessalonians chapter five. We're told, pray, pray, pray. Why? Because the God of the universe, the God that is outside of time and outside of space, needs nothing, needs nothing, wants us to talk to him. In fact, when we're told to boldly come into the throne room of grace, that, that terminology is to come with a loose tongue, to come and just speak to God. And, and don't even worry about what you're going to say because he knows the things that come into your mind anyway. God knows the words that are about in your tongue and God is saying, I want you to come and to speak to me. Isn't that amazing? Amen. And he wants us to make our requests known unto him. I am amazed at that. God has given us prayer. He has given us the ability to come to him and to pray. And I want to look at some of the prayers, some of the things that Solomon prayed. Verse Chapter 6, verse number 19. And, and we're going to bounce quickly, so I'll try to help you with that. But verse 19 of chapter 6, Solomon says, now I want to I give you the context here. Solomon had finished the building of the temple. He had built a platform about seven, seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet, which this is probably seven and a half feet, but it was three to four feet tall. And he got up on top of that scaffolding, that platform, and he knelt before them on his knees and he laid his hands out open and he prayed to God out in front of all the people so that they could hear him. And this was his prayer. Verse 19, have respect therefore unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee. This is a very important phrase, 
that thine eyes may be open upon this house day and night, that thine eyes may be open. Remember that, and we'll get to it later, all right? Verse 21, hearken therefore unto the supplications of thy servant and of thy people Israel, which they shall make toward this place. Hear thou from thy dwelling place, even from heaven, and when thou hearest, forgive. It's important for us not to just get the general sense of what he's praying, but the specific words, okay? When thou hearest, forgive. Verse 22 at the beginning. If a man sin against his neighbor, verse 23 at the beginning, then hear thou from heaven. Verse 24, and if thy people Israel be put to the worst before the enemy, verse 25, then hear thou from the heavens and forgive. Verse 26, when the heaven is shut up and there be no rain because they have sinned against thee, verse 27, then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants. Verse 28, if there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, if there be blasting, mildew, locusts, caterpillars, Verse 29, then what prayer or supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people Israel, when everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hands in this house, then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive. And skip to verse 34. We'll get to the other later. If thy people go out to war against their enemies by way, verse 35, then hear thou from the heavens. Verse 36, if they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and they'll be thou angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away captives into the, a far land or near. Verse 39, then hear thou from the heavens. How often is he saying this? How often? Hear thou from heaven, Lord. Hear from where you are. Hear us. As we call unto you in any of these situations that we fall into sin or we have these negative effects in our lives, would you hear, Lord? Would you hear? God gave us the avenue of prayer. I have a, a friend, he was in my youth group and I was a youth pastor and God has really, has really shot his life out. It's really amazing because some of this he hasn't sought out. He's just been the right person in the right place at the right time. And uh, he's gotten kind of into politics, but he, he, he mostly is uh, a third party in that. He's not really, he's not a politician, but he's spoken out against many things because he was in the system and able to know those things. And so he's been on Fox News as a contributor several times. He has a dedicated producer now. They told him one time recently, they said, if you're gonna be on TV, can you can you not wear cheap, cheap clothes? And he's like, you know, I thought Kohl's wasn't cheap, but I guess it's cheap. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, they took him to a place he had to pay for it, but he said blazers for like $575, you know? And he's like, I guess what I gotta do now. And so he's probably going to get a radio show. He, they, he's been guest hosting, but he'll probably have a radio show on a, on a, a major Indianapolis uh, uh, radio station and an and everyday thing. And just it's kind of neat to see that. I plan on listening. Uh, I plan on listening to him, but I have his phone number. And so if I'm listening and I hear him say something, you better believe I'm going to text him. Now, I don't know if his phone's going to be on, but I also have his email address. And I know that I know that he can get this kind of stuff. And so, uh, yeah, if I have any way to contribute or, or, or get in his face about something, you better believe I'm going to do it. We have that kind of relationship because he's a friend of mine. You know, if you had that kind of relationship with somebody, and maybe you do, you probably use it. You probably, not, look, not for corruption or any, anything like that, but to, look, friends influence friends, do they not? And if, if somebody has an opportunity, you are going to use that. The God of heaven has asked you to influence him with your words. That's what prayer is, to, to seek the heart of God. And we know throughout scripture, men have sought the heart of God and God has answered. Women have sought the heart of God and God has answered. We can go to God and God will listen. It doesn't mean every time he's gonna give us what we want, but what does God want? Does God wanna work in your heart? Yes. Does God want to work in the hearts of those people around you? Yes. You can call and ask God to do something that he wants to do, and it's just a little push. There's many prayer requests that I have had and, and, and asked God for and, and seen God answer those prayers, and people, people say, you prayed for that? And I said, yeah. Why do you think I got it? Nobody else prayed for it. You know, they, they, they might have wanted the same thing, but they didn't ask. And I thought, you know, you can ask. And that's what James tells us. You have not because you ask not. You know, why do you think sometimes we don't have the work of God in our midst? Are we asking for it? 
I'm not going to ask people, I'm not going to ask you, but I kind of wonder, the people that are not right with God that have been connected to this church, are you praying for them? I'm sure some of you are, but what if all of you were? What about the people that are connected to this church or connected to you? Are you praying for them that they would be saved? You ought to. Amen. Now, does God? Why does God not work? Often, I think it's because his people do not pray. And God has said, I've given you this so that you can come to the throne of grace and ask me for help in time of need, and you can find grace to help in time of need. God says, I want to pour out myself upon you. I want to pour out my grace upon you. He has given us all things that pertain to that. Why would we not utilize the gift of prayer? And then secondly, I want you to notice chapter 7 and verse 14. He says, this is the one that we, we think about. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their, their land. God gave us prayer, but we need prayer. As I look at that verse, that's one of the things that, that I see, that his people can sometimes need to humble themselves. They need to talk to God. They need to seek his face. They need to turn from their wicked ways. Is that not the case for our country? Amen. You know, the church is supposed to be a restraining force in this world. We're not doing a very good job. We're not doing a very good job. If you just look at America over the last 20 years and ask yourself, has the church done any restraining? Well, I'm sure it's done something because that's what God does through us, but he only does that to the extent which we really allow him to work through our lives. We're not doing a very good job. You know, I've heard stories of, in America, churches that God used that church to shut the liquor stores down in that town. I had not heard that happening in decades. Maybe one time, and I'm trying to scratch my brain to try to remember where that was, that God shut something down in, in the whole town because, because the movement of the people of God and what God was doing, not as a political thing, but as a spiritual thing, now that's our country. We can look at the wickedness of our country, but we, can, we should turn our eyes inward and say, God, are we where you want us to be? You know, I, I know that we can all say, yeah, we're not where we ought to be, but God, help us to, to, to see the specific things in our lives. Help us to be making the steps that we need to take to be what you want us to be. Help us to be concerned about those that are around us because God, we need you to work on our behalf. Lord, help us to be humble. Pride is blinding. I'm going to be vague, but in the last 25 years, there was a presidential candidate that eventually became president. So that's, that's pretty vague, 25 years, okay? That was interviewed and was asked about things that they needed to ask for forgiveness for, and the candidate said, I never needed to ask forgiveness for anything. That's hard to believe because it's impossible. It's impossible. And, and you know, that's pride. That's what that is. And, and maybe, they, maybe, maybe they were just speaking in hyperbole and, and, and not trying to point anything out specifically and trying to brush things under the rug. I don't know. Or maybe it was just, just straight up their pride that they could not see their own faults. But you know, there are people like that everywhere. There's people like that in churches that we think we're okay. My status quo is not okay. My comparison with my fellow church member is not okay because who I should be judging myself against is the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and my measure is the word of God. That is my only measure. And when I compare myself to him and see where I fall short, I need to go and say, God, please forgive me for where I fall short. Show me the specific areas that you would like me to work on. And God, I need you to do the work in my life. I need you to convict me in those ways. That's where we need to be. That's where I need to be. To have the humility to see when preaching takes place that that's what I need. There's been times in my life where people talked about revival and I would look and say, well, look, I try to make decisions when I hear preaching. I, I, try, to, I try to have my heart open and, and, and self-examine and see if I am missing in these things. I try to be there. I, I'm singing the songs. I'm praying. I'm doing all those things. I'm trying to be right. I, you know, what? What, do I really need revival? If I'm saying those things, I need revival. Sure. If I'm thinking that I'm okay, I need revival. 
Because I compare, I need to compare myself with what God could do through me. Amen. And my comparison is not another person, but my comparison might be, God, what have you done through people in the past? And why am I not there? Because I'm not any different than King David. I'm not any different than, than, than Joseph. I'm not any different than Joshua. I'm not any different than Peter as a human being. And God is not changed. And so why are we not seeing God work in our midst? This church in Tower Hill isn't any different than any church in any major city in America. You say, well, we're not as big, but your God is. Amen. But your God is. There is no reason. Look, there's churches all across America in tiny little towns that are bursting their, their seams because God's doing work. And, and God could do more. And we need to compare ourselves, not with somebody else, but with what God could do in our lives and let that force us on our knees to say, God, we need to seek your face. You know, there's so many things that we pursue. We pursue sports. We, we pursue fun entertainment. We, we pursue hobbies. Look, I've got hobbies. There's things I enjoy. But my focus needs to be what God would do in my life. That's where, that's where my, my main pursuit ought to be. Amen. My main focus in all that I do. I need to make sure that God is the center of all those things. But we need prayer because we need God. We need to humble ourselves and pray. Seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. What ways do we have that are wicked? And you might say, oh, I'm not sure. Well, then we need to seek God's face. We need to say, God, what is it? We need that prayer. We need prayer to seek God for, for what he would have us to do. If we don't need God to work in our churches, then why is it the churches that I preach in have adultery in them? Because that's, you know, we're there and we find out later, oh, so-and-so, they're getting a divorce because, the, you know, so-and-so is cheating. Well, why is that the case? Why is it that, that missionaries that we support in our church, why is it that they're having to come home from the mission field because adultery was there? Why is that? Because we need to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from wicked ways. Amen. Because all of us are a skin away from, from that sin. We're, we're just a paper thin away from, from falling into something because we're not careful and we're not pursuing him with what we should be, but we need that prayer. And then thirdly, because God answers prayer. Notice in verse number 12, and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer. I have that underlined, I have heard. See that past tense? And have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear, that's future, from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, that's present, now mine eyes shall be opened. Remember that phrase I told you to remember? He said, will you open your eyes to this place? He says, now my eyes are open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. I am hearing, I have heard, and I will hear. Isn't that a great promise of God? That his ears are attent. Amen. So he, he's saying, you have my attention. My eyes are looking. Have you ever listened to somebody with just your ears? You, you, you can do it. You know, because you're focused on something else. You can hear them and you can listen, but usually not as well. And I realize God doesn't have these problems that we have. But when we look at someone and we listen to them, we get a whole lot more out of it, don't we? That's right. And I don't think God is saying, I'm going to get more out of it. What he's trying to tell us is everything that you ask me to do, I'm doing that. I'm inclining myself to you. I'm giving you this attention. This is what I want you to do. I want you to come to me. And we can have, there's tremendous examples through the rest of Second Chronicles of people when they did turn to God and say, God, we're in trouble. We don't, we don't have any knowledge of how we're going to fix this. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And you promised, God, you promised that when we did this here, that you would answer. And God outpours himself upon them and does a great work. And I believe God can still do that. Does that mean that if God doesn't do that in this meeting that I'm wrong? No, it doesn't. Does it mean it's your fault or my fault? No. We don't know what God wants to do with this meeting. But the point is this. We should not stop praying for God to do a great work when Friday evening is done. Amen. If that's what we do, we really didn't want it. We were just wanting to see a miracle. 
We were just one of those people that followed Jesus just to see something flashy. We're not here for the flashy. We're here for what God can do in our lives. And what we need God to do is bring people back to himself. Convict them that they are away from God. Convict them that they need God. They say that Welsh revival that in one year that over 100,000 people were saved. That is incredible. Not near the size of the United States of America. I don't know what the equivalent would be, but I, I would imagine there would be millions of people. Can God do that? Yeah, he can. But do we ask him for it? It was said that two young men at the beginning of that year, maybe nine months prior to that year, prayed specifically that God would save 100,000 people. When was the last time you prayed that God would do something great? It doesn't have to be us. But Lord, our country, our country has problems. You know, often I, I meet somebody from Illinois, and they'll say, I'm from Illinois, but not Chicago. Yeah. You know, that, that's what I, but not Chicago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people have talked about, you know, seceding from Chicago or whatever. I don't know how that works. But look, our problems in this state and in our country are not political problems. They're spiritual problems. That's right. And the, the, the problems that we have in our country are, are, are problems that deal with sin. And God wants to use us to be a light. And I look at this and I look at a situation we're in. I don't like it. I want it to change. But I saw, also see that when it's dark, the light shines brighter, does it not? Yes, sir. And, but is, is our light shining brighter or are we fading into the darkness? Because God is our light, and we need him to be doing work in our lives, and we need to be praying for him to do that. Meetings that we've had just this year, seeing people say that people were praying for. Praying in a meeting, Lord, would you? We're out in the middle of, you think, this is in the middle of nowhere? We were, we were, we were 45 minutes from a Walmart in South Tennessee, and that's, that's pretty far away. When you, when you have to measure how far you are from Walmart, uh, you know, that's your, that's your distance. And that church was sort of like this in the sense that it was, you couldn't hardly see anything from where the church was. It was in the sticks. We had to drive an hour to church. And when we leave at nighttime, it was so dark. I mean, you couldn't hardly see anything. One night, we're in an old church van, old church van. The doors were idling like crazy. And we're driving down the road in the dark. And all of a sudden, the lights in the van stopped working. I mean, you could, you could not see in front of you. And uh, the pastor goes, oh, boy. You know? <laughs> So he reaches down and rattles it a little bit, and the lights come back on. So we, we made it home, but we were way out in the middle of nowhere, and, but we were still praying that God would save someone that week. And we had two people saved on the very last service. Amen. You know, and, and it's just great to see when God answers prayer, and I think that God thinks, you know, I can do so much more than that. And sometimes it's, it, God wants us to pray collectively that he would do something. There's something that bothers me about this verse, and that is that there's some people that will say that this is not for the church. And they'll say, well, look at that verse, verse 14. If my people, which are called in my name, this is Solomon's praying. Solomon is asking that God would do something for his people Israel. And so that's what it's talking about. And you can go further, and at the end it says, heal their land, that God has not given us the land. And I, I would agree that 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 Solomon is not our pastor, right? And we are not Israel. We don't replace Israel. The church is not Israel. But are we not God's people? Yes. Absolutely, we're God's people. Are we called by his name? Yes. Even yes. more so, we are called by his name. We are Christians. We are called by the world, little Christ. We have been made, adopted as his sons. We, have, we call him Abba Father, we have every right to claim this verse for that. And even if we didn't, go back to chapter 6, and verse 32. Solomon prayed, moreover concerning the stranger. In the Old Testament, the stranger is the Gentile. It's the non-Jew who says, I want to follow God. He says, moreover, the stranger, which is not of thy people, Israel, but has come from a far country for thy name, great name's sake, and thy mighty hand and thy stretched out arm, if they come and pray in this house, then hear thou from the heavens, even from thy dwelling place, and do according to all the stranger calleth for thee for, that all the people of the earth may know thy name and fear thee, as doth thy people Israel, and may know that this house which I have built is called by thy name. Then hear from heaven, 
Do you think God is saying, I will answer all your prayers, Solomon, except that part? No, he did not make any exceptions. He very clearly was saying, Solomon, everything that you've prayed, I'm going to answer that. And it is very clear that God loves the stranger no less than he loves the Jew. Amen. He just chose them to be his representative on the planet for that time. And now the representatives on the planet for this time, for this time, are, is the church. And it's obvious that God has given us something. Besides all that, is God not a God that won't answer people when they say, God, we need you to work because we're in sin? Absolutely, God's going to answer that prayer. Absolutely, God wants to show his name strong on the behalf of his people who say, God, we need you. And moreover, the temple that he said, I will destroy, I will raise it up in three days. Was he talking about his body? Yes. Was he talking about the temple? Yeah, because it was destroyed. The veil that separated was torn in two. There is no more high priest needed. In fact, he is our high priest that is passed, great high priest, that is passed into the heavens so that we can all come boldly into the throne and say, God, we need you to work on our behalf. And he says, I want you to do that because I want to work on your behalf. Amen. We need to pray. Very clearly, we need to pray. And every time you have a revival meeting and every time in between, you need to pray. God, do a work. You know, our prayer is not just about our families. It's not just about our lives. It's not just about the things that we have. God wants us to pray for all those things. But we need to be praying for the church that God has put us in, that God would do a work. That God would work in every heart according to his word. That hearts would be surrendered and submissive to what God would have us to do. Because God can revive us. Yeah. There is no reason, and, and people will say, well, I don't see, I don't see America in, in, in prophecy. Well, America didn't exist back then, for one. And number two, it's not maybe because we're destroyed by a nuclear holocaust or whatever. It could be that there's a, that there's a national awakening and a great revival so that there's nobody left. Look, if I'm going to side on the side of positivity and what God can do and not, what, not the negativity of what sin can do. We need to pray accordingly. God... Do a work in our midst. God, you can. While we have the freedom to preach your word, God, use it. God, use the darkness to make your light brighter. God, use the sin to draw a distinction between your people and the people of the world. Draw that, show that sin as, as a place of no hope, that it doesn't give you any hope, but that God is the God of all hope. Yeah, we need to pray. With your head's bowed and eyes closed.